Hi everyone and welcome back to unitycookie.com for another in the tower defense tutorial series. So in this tutorial we'll be adding in the ground based units and a bit of pathfinding and AI. So depending on what luck we get, get a couple different units in here. We still have the flying units from before. Let's see if a uh, random chance works out when I actually get a tank to come in. So there we go. You can see him coming in just there. And you'll notice if I drop any kind of item, say, right in front of his path, it'll move to avoid it. And this will work as well if you have any kind of uh, static obstacles or anything like that in your level. So whether well, it might be buildings or, or things like that, uh, it'll auto the tanks or the ground units will automatically go right around. So to get all that working, we had to add in quite a bit, not terribly complicated, but a good bit. The main part being we now have some AI pathfinding. And I had originally really wanted to try and build up something from scratch, something that we could just uh, put together, but it turned out it just wasn't going to happen. So I ended up looking around and found a really nice free and easy to use A Star Pathfinding, and that is the A Star Pathfinding project by Aaron Greenberg at AaronGreenberg.com. There's a free version you can download and a pro version if you'd like some extra features. Obviously, we'll just be using the free version as everything we need in it, uh, and even more, really. This is a great project and can really, really be handy, especially, obviously, for a tower defense. So just go ahead and check out this link. Of course, I'll make sure there's a link to that in the tutorial. And you can find the download, get it set up, and then import it into Unity. So just as usual, download it, double-click, bring it into your project, and we can start looking at it in the Unity scene itself. So back in Unity, go ahead and create uh, just a scene. I called mine Pathfinding Test here. And you want to set it up something like this, where you have a single plane for the ground and several obstacle objects, just to make the AI have a bit more, a bit more trouble getting around in this. Once you have that ready, you'll want to go ahead and uh, jump back onto the A Star Pathfinding Project site, go into the documentation, and find the Getting Started with A Star Pathfinding tutorial. I'll of course make sure there's a link to this as well, so you can jump right to it from the uh, from the Unity Cookie site. So once you have that open, you'll notice that it goes step by step through every single thing you'll need to know in order to build your pathfinding. And this is exactly what I used for our tutorial here. So if at any point you get lost or something isn't making a lot of sense as we go through this, just you know feel free to go back and follow what he has here exactly step by step and it'll come out just fine. Uh, and of course, ask any questions on the form that you need and so forth, or on the tutorial that is, I mean. Whoops. Okay. So going back to our scene, first thing you'll need to do uh, on these objects is set the ground plane to be the layer called ground and the obstacles to be a layer called obstacles. Also make sure that all of your items, the obstacles or ground, have a collider of some sort on them and that they are not a trigger. We'll need this so that the AI knows to move around them and can stay on the ground without falling through. Next, it'll be time to actually bring in the A star pathfinding controller. So go ahead and create a empty game object. Place it just about anywhere you like. And then from the component menu, you'll have a new option called pathfinding. And this will be, again, once you've imported that A star pathfinding project, make sure you've done that. And then go over to pathfinder. So drop that component onto your game object and you can name it a star. You'll see I already have mine up in the scene here. Maybe I'll go ahead and delete that so we can create a new one actually. All right, so you have your new game object and name it underscore a star. Of course, the actual name doesn't really matter. I just like to give things that I know I want to access in a special way at the very top. Uh, I put the underscore in front of them so they always stay at the top there. And a star just helps me know what it is. You can also, if you click on the uh, box item here next to the name and the inspector, choose one of these options. Uh, the larger ones will give you uh, an actual, you can view the name. The others will just give you a dot or some such. I'm going to choose the orange one. And now you'll see that I have sort of a, 
a visible representation of that empty game object. So it's easy to find it in the level. Click on it and edit it in case you aren't looking in the hierarchy at the time. So the very first thing that you'll need to do with the A-Star project depends on if you're using JavaScript or C-sharp. For this tutorial, I'm teaching everything in JavaScript as usual, so you'll probably want to follow with that, but if you'd really rather use C-sharp and you're going to translate everything I'm saying, then that's okay. You won't need to do this step, but for those of you who want to use JavaScript, I'm assuming most people, you want to go down uh, again with your A-Star object selected, click on Settings in the inspector, and then there'll be a tag for Editor, and open that up. And mine is already set up, but you'll need to click on the uh, Enable JavaScript Support button. And it should be pretty quick. It'll just basically run through and make sure the project, or not the project, but the A-Star setup is all ready to go for JavaScript. It does a couple things, moving the folders around and such. This is a, a really nice addition that they have. Otherwise, you'd have to manually move some folders, if you remember, uh, in some of the NGUI, uh, NGUI tutorials, uh, you had to do it manually. So just make sure you click that setup for JavaScript support if you're going to be using JavaScript, which is the assumption. And then we can move on to actually adding in the AI graph. So up top under graphs, click on that, and we have nothing so far. There's a couple different types of graphs we're really going to be only looking at and using the grid graph. The others you should definitely explore on the A-Star Pathfinding documentation. But for now, we just want to add a new grid graph. So click on that. And you'll see we get a grid popping in right away. Now that this grid is in our scene, we can click on Grid Graph under the Graphs heading and take a look at the graph that we just created. A couple settings in here we'll need to look at first one, obviously this grid isn't large enough for what we're doing here. So if you take a look at the size of your plane and then just match the, uh, the width and depth to that. So if I look at mine, it says it's 3 by 3 by 3 but planes are for some reason a multiple of 10 on the size. So if I go back to my A star, I believe if I set the width and de depth to 30, it should match it just right. Looks about right, but obviously it's not centered properly. So let's just set the center here, 0, 0, and 0, and then click Snap Size. And that'll move it right onto the plane that we have there. So now your viewport might be moving a little bit slowly, but this all should be looking correctly. If you turn on 3D gizmos, it might make it a little easier to view. And you'll see that the nodes are set up. Well, the grid is set up, that is. So down below, we have the collision testing and height testing. The mask you'll want to set for the collision testing to be only obstacles. That's why we set those up with that layer. And the height testing, the same thing, except we want it to be nothing except ground. Again, that layer we set up for just the ground. Once you have that, go ahead and click Scan and it sets up our graph. One last thing that the documentation recommends is to set your center at negative 0.1. Just bring the graph up a tiny bit. You can click snap size once again, I believe, just in case. And uh, apparently that just makes sure that you don't have some ray casting errors and such if it's at exactly the same uh, zero, zero as the ground. So that can help, so make sure that your y is at negative 0.1. Now we're going to set up the actual AI in your scene. So go ahead and just create for now a capsule and drop it down onto the scene, right onto the ground. And place it just about anywhere. Shouldn't matter if your pathfinding works correctly, of course. And you'll need to add on a new component, again under the pathfinding, the seeker component, and don't worry about any of the settings just yet. Although you do want to make sure that draw gizmos is on so we can see where its path will be leading. Next, we're going to build the actual AI script for this object. So I have already built one that you can follow along. And in the project, again, if you have all the project files, this is uh, entirely commented. 
and I'll try and move through this slowly so you can all uh, easily follow along and build up your own just as easily. So the first thing to do is to import the pathfinding. You just need to make sure you have this at the top of any scripts that are using the pathfinding at all. So bring that in. In my case, for the tank, I have a couple extra items, the tank turret, tank body, and a compass to make it turn and look. All of these being transforms. There's a turn speed. And then I have a target position, which is where the, uh, obviously the AI is going towards. We have a reference to the seeker component on this object and a reference to a character controller component, which we'll be adding in a minute. We have a reference to the path. This is the path that the AI will actually be following, the speed it moves at, and a couple items uh, that are more internal, just the next waypoint distance and the current waypoint that it's at. So first thing in the start function, we're going to find the target position. And the way I have this set up is just by creating a game object. Move this off to the side. So I have this object here, and I've given it a tag called ground target object. So this is what all ground enemies are going to be converging on. So again, in the start, the target position is set to the position of whatever, whatever object it finds with the tag ground target object. Obviously, make sure you have just one of those or things could get confused. Once it has that target position, it calls get new path. And in get new path, I have a quick debug to make sure it's working all right. Might actually just turn that off for now. And a seeker.start path, uh, and it drops in the current position, the position it's going to, and then on path complete is the function it's going to call when that's finished. Down below, we have that on path complete and it's pulling in the new path that was just completed by the seeker. So it checks, number one, if a new path, if there's no error, if it's a, a proper working path, then we set that path variable to be the new path, which was, again, just passed in up here. And we make sure and set the current waypoint back to zero, just in case. So that's the, uh, the index of, of the waypoints we're at. So we just want to make sure we always start back at zero when we're starting a new path. Down below, we have function fixed update. This is basically the exact same thing as update, except it happens on the physics time step. So in a way, every physics frame, this is going to happen versus every visual frame for the function update. And we're doing this because the character controller that this is interfacing with to move uses physics. So we want to stick with fixed update. A couple things here. First of all, we check if the path is null, doesn't even exist. If it doesn't, of course, of course, don't do anything. And also we check if we've already reached the end of the path. If so, do nothing at all. Exit this loop. Probably in the future, you might want to do something more there. So when it reaches the end, it does something of some sort. Nothing for now, of course. Going down, we're going to find the direction to the next waypoint. So pretty simple direction, getting a vector of three and getting uh, the current waypoint where we are, or sorry, uh, where we're going to minus where we currently are, which will give us a direction once you normalize that. We multiply that by the speed and we get a velocity. Then we can actually move the uh, our AI item using the character controller. So again, this is the controller from up top here. We've referenced that to the character controller there. Just a bit below, we're going to set the rotation so that the uh, tank or whatever the unit might be will constantly look down the direction of the path and it'll do it nice and smoothly. So one thing I've found is that you can't unfortunately have, as these original, uh, you'll see these commented out items are, you can't just move, or you can't use quaternion.lerp between the object that the script script is actually on and, a, and another, um, rotation, it won't actually work out. So I've just made a, a bit of a workaround by creating a tank compass, so to speak. So it has just a separate object inside the compass. We'll take a look at that. So 
So in the tank prefab, that's just a compass object and simply an empty game object that is exactly rotated and placed the same as the uh, the main game, game object it's in, in this case a tank prefab. And we want to connect that up to the tank compass variable in the inspector. So the tank compass goes ahead and looks at the next waypoint so it just constantly looks at the next one that we're moving towards and then we simply uh, rotate the body we lerp it towards that rotation so taking it what it currently is and rotating it towards the tank compass by time dot delta time times turn speed so that just smoothly constantly lerps it so it's always moving towards the uh, the proper orientation and by multiplying it by turn speed you can control exactly how fast this object can actually turn Finally, at the end of our script, we just check if we're close enough to the next waypoint to move on to the next one. And if so, we push up the current waypoint to the next and move on. Now, this capsule that we're using for testing obviously doesn't have a tank compass or a couple other things. So just for testing this out, make sure and comment out that tank compass that look at and also the tank body dot rotation. So we won't be doing any kind of rotation on the on the capsule. Would it matter anyway? Couldn't tell. So once you have that, we can move back into the scene. And then we'll need to attach that character controller component, which is under the component and then physics character controller. It'll ask you if you want to replace the existing capsule collider. That's fine. Hit replace. And then we need to drop in a couple variables on the ground unit script. So just grab the capsule itself, its own self, and drag and drop that into the body. And do the same for the seeker and the character, since of course those components are both, both on this item itself. And now if I hit play, we'll see it's moving right toward the target object, going around the obstacles. And if I pause it for a second, you can see that each of the items that's moving towards the target has its own little green line extending from behind it. Might be a little easier to see in the wireframe view. There we go. So here you can see the exact path that each item is following. So this is useful if you're wondering why perhaps uh, your objects aren't really working in the right way. They don't seem to be following a good path. Looks like you can just check out on wireframe. Uh, and see very easily exactly how those those green paths are following to the destination. Otherwise, in textured, it's a bit hard to see. Undo the pause, and there we have it. Our objects moving in exactly as, as they should, following the paths and moving to the target. So we have the basic AI implemented. Now we'll just need to set that up properly on the actual tank object. However, since we're already right around the 20 some minute mark and there's actually quite a bit to do putting together the tank as well as integrating it with the actual in-game scene and setting up the game to work with flying and ground units and then we're even going to rebuild a lot of the scripts in a way to make them all use a nice extend, uh, class extending method we'll go ahead and move that into a separate tutorial so we'll sign off on this one but thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next when we bring it all together in the actual game with ground and flying units See you then.